what I wanted to do in this uh, uh, brief set of comments is indicate issues in uh, an identification that have shown up in the economics literature and identifying uh, mechanisms uh, to explain aggregate differences. Now, in some sense, when I t say it's about genetics, that's, not, that's really not fair. It's a, more of a statement about what have proven to be limitations in the use of, uh, of observational data in uncovering any class of, uh, of aggregate effects. And so, by implication, it would apply to uh, claims about the role of genes uh, uh, just as it would for, for any, other, any other phenomenon. In doing that, uh, it is not obviously a statement that questions any particular empirical claim. It's merely indicating when, uh, at least from some perspectives, uh, uh, claims have been fragile as opposed to uh, what I'll call sturdy in a, in a bit. In addition, I hope that this will indicate why genomic data alters the uh, terms, shall we say, of, uh, uh, of inference. In other words, there's going to be a qualitative change, I think, uh, relative to the types of studies that I, that I refer to. So in the, uh, in the two remarks, uh, the first comment I wanted to make is that what has proven devilishly hard in terms of evidence to explain cross-population behaviors, cross-country behaviors, uh, uh, for example, has had to do with what uh, uh, jargon-wise is called model uncertainty. And what I mean by that is that you know, claims about uh, any phenomena, such as uh, a statement about the role of genes in economic growth. Uh, these are going to be statements that take data sets, some set of, uh, of random variables, filter them through a statistical model, and then make, make claims. I'll use Bayesian language, but everything will apply equally well to frequentist perspectives. And what I think is a reasonable statement is that efforts to, to use statistical data to pr provide evidence of mechanisms have often uh, floundered, are, are foundered on, th on three problems. The first is simply theoretical disagreements, and what I mean by that is that exercises that do these cross-unit comparisons take stances not only on what one wants to run in the horse race, genes versus language, for example, but also on what one wants to omit. So when I looked at your, uh, you know, your table, it's not, you know, obviously since I, we, I published the, <laughs> we thought it was important enough work to be in the handbook, uh, this is a, you know, stated by a friend. You know, a question in that would be, well, why, why wasn't religion uh, an alternative mechanism by which we would think about the spread? In which case, we would think of France as the out... Yeah, so, so let me just play this out. The way that, relative to those exercises, we would think is, you would have to ask a question such as, well, here's my story, and that is France secularizes because of the French Revolution, and so it's an outlier, and then I have a different... I want to make a different set of arguments for the other countries, or putting that uh, d differently. Uh, there's an interesting regularity, which is the fertility translations are associated with a fraction of socialist votes in various countries. And uh, that's been argued to be the secularization uh, evidence, so on and so forth. The point, again, is not to criticize anything that Enrico or anybody else has said. It's so much to recognize that in these models, they're actually typically freighted with substantive social science assumptions. And often you see heterogeneity in empirical claims that are simply an artifice of the... Uh, the use of, uh, of, of different uh, conditioning variables or uh, different degrees of complexity uh, in modeling the phenomena uh, uh, as well. I skip parametric forms because in some sense that's boring. <laughs> and, uh, however, in some cases it matters. And the third comment I'm going to refer to is exchangeability. And that is not a, you know, that's a, a somewhat Eric, pompous term for simply saying at some point when you're using these aggregates you have to ask whether or not there's a, a commensurability that makes the empirical exercises interpretable. All right, and so a question that, often, that I would claim comes up, again, in the cr study of cross-populations is whether or not one uses the same statistical model to describe sub-Saharan Africa as one would use for the OECD. You might think that the, the generative mechanisms, I use the theory you want to condition on, but nevertheless that begs the question of whether the parameters uh, ought to be equal to one another. All right, and so these, these issues uh, show up again and again in... In the, in the economics literature in trying to study population uh, differences, and they've, uh, they, they've rendered uh, a lot of the, the empirical work, I don't want to say you know, wrong so much as, as not terribly credible. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure I get this in, oh, or, oh, there we go. So I think that um, uh, a, a lesson that comes out of this literature, and that, so at least a method that some economists, have, including myself, have been interested in, is how to 
how to move inferences away from this, this fragility, this sensitivity to, uh, to these various types of assumptions. Now notice that when I put on the table, I think that you should have controlled for religion. <laughs> you, you, that's, that's, you know, that's an argument. Now, that's something intellectually we could, we could question. And the end of the day is we're not going to be able to resolve that per se. We'd have to simply say it's something we need to think about. And so the, the, really the points of following, and this is what, the sense in which I've unfairly uh, put G in. So suppose there's some object you wanted to describe, some posterior density uh, just about some, some property, what I'll call it a genetic property. In other words, a role of, of, of some genetic mechanism in, uh, in socioeconomic outcomes. The typical empirical exercise generates this posterior probability statement that says that uh, given the data and some model, I've assumed, this is what I'm going to say. All right, and so when I say to you that there's been, uh, you know, terrible disagreements in the, in the study of, of economic growth over the theoretical commitments that are going to be made and the uh, exchangeability assumptions, or I told you in a very different context that in the study of the deterrent effect of capital punishment, you get completely different answers according to whether you use, uh, you know, trends of one form versus another. Those are all statements that, uh, uh, that a individuals are using different models through which to filter the data, and that therefore begs the question as to how do you move beyond these dueling, uh, dueling model-specific claims. And so the, the standard procedure, of course, would be to, see if I can uh, operationalize, uh, work this right, would be to, to ask questions such as, is it possible to make statements that don't condition on individual models, but at least condition on some class of models we'd like to, we'd like to entertain? And that's what the so-called uh, model averaging literature does. And the idea is no deeper than saying that rather than condition that this is the correct model, you condition on some space of models that you wish to entertain. All right, and so by Bayes' rule, you integrate out, as it were, at least in this case, literally average out the, uh, the dependence on a particular model. And again, and it's just an elementary calculation. It says you take all the model-specific posteriors and you weight them by the uh, conditional, again, the posterior probabilities of models given the data. Okay, and so at least as a statement, that sounds, uh, you know, like a, a way to think about it, which is that one wants to respect the level of uncertainty or the ignorance of the analyst at the beginning of the process and account for that. Now, what's interesting, uh, just as a, a little quick calculation, is you know, shock of shocks, the expected value of something is going to be a weighted average of the model-specific expected values. But the interesting thing is the following, and that is if I asked you what's the uncertainty associated with some claim given a model space as opposed to a model, one has a weighted average of the model-specific uncertainty plus something new. And that is the variation of the, you know, the, that's the point estimates of your frequency, the posterior main of a Bayesian, around the model-specific expected value. And that's actually capturing the idea that each model, if, it's, if they're giving very different answers, that's part of the uncertainty that needs to be reported by the analyst. And so you can get, and I left a, a probability there out, I apologize. And so you can get situations where every, uh, every claim that's model specific makes the claims with certainty. There's no, there's no within model uh, uh, problem, but because of the heterogeneity in the models, uh, you in fact could conclude the, evi the evidence is quite weak. Now, as a, you know, as you say, applications in the literature, uh, one example is the, stu the, the search for growth mechanisms. And so uh, I think that a fair statement is that uh, if one looks at the, uh, the, the plethora of alternative mechanisms that have been proposed and sort of analyzes available data through that, that, that rich model space, very little turns out to be quote unquote robust. In other words, it won't survive in terms of a high pos posterior probability of being a significant object. Part of the importance of Enrico's work is it moves beyond that by identifying salient data properties, in other words, correlations and, and some at higher order uh, relationships, and then moves into the mechanisms. And so uh, those are distinct empirical exercises, and that uh, needs to be on the table. Second example, it turned out that uh, the deterrence effect of capital punishment is, uh, it, it, evidence of that is, uh, to be blunt, useless. And so there are, there are papers that have claimed things that uh, every execution saves 17 lives. Others have shown, have models where every execution costs 52 lives. The answer is they're all equally correct. All right. Final comment is, uh, of course, the actions in these posterior model probabilities. Now, why do I say that? Because they, have to, they incorporate two things. The first is, obviously, models that, in some sense, fit the data well in, our, in the appropriate metric, uh, which is just a, a likely, an integrated likelihood. They had to get more weight. 
And then the second thing is naturally the devil in, the, uh, in these calculations, which is the posterior. How do we start off by assigning probabilities? And I'll simply say that's a, uh, a contested area. You might say, well, if the model space, assume everything's uniform. That uh, it, it's just an example of uh, confusion over principle of insufficient reason. There's work by uh, Ed George in statistics, and I'll, I'll tap my co-authors and I for trying to use uh, social science-informed priors, which is a fancy way of saying that one wants to distinguish between layers of model uncertainty and create a logical consistency between the way that prior probabilities are assigned. So that's, that, that, so that's, that's really what I want to put on the table. Is with respect to the study of aggregates using uh, observational data, uh, this model uncertainty issue certainly based on other contexts is first order. Second comment was just a comment, the thing I wanted to remark on it was, uh, you know, how do we think about identification of different types of effects in, uh, in, in econometric models? And so to keep life simple, let's just take a linear model. And at least a way I would think uh, to think about it is we had some outcome we're interested in, omega IT, and we think there's different things that determine it. Some things could be group specific, and so uh, there may be measure, and so groups obviously I'll be equating with ethnicity in a bit. So there's, there's factors that are specific to some ethnic group that, I, that are measurable, such as a degree of discrimi you know, legal discrimination or something like that. Another thing is I might say if I'm thinking about individual level data, I condition on an X, stuff I can observe about them. And then I might introduce two types of social influences. One is the characteristics of others matter for me. The other is the behaviors of others matter for me. So it's one thing to say the role models in my neighborhood affected me. It's a different thing to say my classmates affected me. And then the final will be some notion of unobserved heterogeneity. And uh, to keep life simple, I don't, I'm initially going to treat that as uncorrelated with the, uh, the data that I have. So, and then notice that the social structures is determined by some sociomatrices. So if you said, can I identify, uh, whoops, I keep turning this upside down. Uh, where am I? Yeah. I'm trying to live this absent-minded professor life. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Now, the answer is, of course, no. And that is without some information or some prior uh, restrictions on that social structure, uh, it, it's a st st classical simultaneous equations problem. Nothing's identified. And in fact, what can show? Uh, can sort of map out the assumptions possibility frontier and asking what must be the strength of prior information on social influences such that conditional on that prior information observational data could allow me to disentangle these types of effects. So uh, here's, a, here's a crude way that one might want to think about a genetic influence in the context of this model and this model is reasonably ubiquitous in, in, in micro level empirical work and I say well Again, I had some idea in the back of my head that there was a, a, you know, a group-specific difference, a shift variable, which I'll call alpha g. I'm only going to focus on cross-sections, and so the way I want to think about it is each population could have a specific uh, mean difference, and then there's some residual unobserved heterogeneity. And uh, there we go. Let's try this one. Uh, I want to say the following, and that is, First, these are identified. In other words, if I can identify group influences in general, I can identify the thing I called the latent variable, which was the group-specific genetic effect. And I know I'm doing violence to how you guys are thinking about it. But at least as a statistical object where I say there's something about the group, it's unobservable, I want to account for it. That's the good news. And the bad news is... Uh, the following, and that, it, well, actually, there's two points. One of them is that there actually is no information structure, uh, information in the, uh, in the covariance structure of the errors. What I mean by that, whatever you told me about the correlations of the epsilons, they say nothing about uh, whether or not alpha is identified. This is a question I put to you since I, you know, you're the experts on it, and that is why a twin study would speak to anything about uh, mean differences in ethnic IQ. Now, why do I say that? Because in this formulation, the only thing alpha is, is some unobservable that's common across the groups. And obviously, I could have extremely high heritability for the same unconditional means. And so when you calculate a covariance, et cetera, you're taking the means out, and it begs the question of what you're taking out. And so I, my view is that uh, uh, I haven't seen a good argument as to why a twin study would speak to uh, something about population groups. But that could be a function of ignorance. Second comment is, from this perspective, these are unobserved fixed effects, and there is no mechan mechanism to interpret. 
But that tells you exactly where the genomic data has to be critical. In other words, from the perspective of these classical things, we're dealing with these, these systems of unobservables, and then we're using either, you know, genetic similarity or other types of a priori restrictions to uncover something about one of the unobservable objects, but the genomic data obviously is qualitatively, the whole point is no longer observable, it's something to see, and that's going to be fundamental, I think. Final comment is that in these models, uh, for th self-selection is, is kind of a fundamental idea. In other words, if I was talking about neighborhoods or uh, personnel versus institutions and the like, uh, you, you have to sort of ask, well, you know, typically these, these things, for, these groups are they themselves endogenous, and, and there's somebody named Heckman who uh, worked <laughs> basically, okay, the serious point is, uh, you know, focus on this issue of selection on various types of unobserved heterogeneity, and the, the, you know, the, the, the monumental idea that comes out of that work is, if you're worried about self-selection, model it. In other words, don't treat it as some, you know, requiring natural experiments or what have you, but rather bring social science to bear to let you model the self-selection, and it turns out that not only will not, uh, not be a barrier to identification, but it is facilitating of identification. Why? Because the factors that you care about identifying, they're influencing the self-selection. Now, I don't know to what extent this matters if I'm talking about ethnic groups. I do know Elias Saperstein has uh, produced evidence, which I haven't had a chance to fully uh, process, arguing that there's actually some endogeneity in, uh, in how we identify groups. And so that might be something interesting to think about. Uh, she found, uh, looking at data sets in which, uh, I guess the analysts, why you see what the interviewer classifications are for the same person, they're changing across yeah. time, and they're actually predictable. That's the strange part. So I merely put that on, uh, on the table. And so examples where, as an outsider, I worry about self-selection. An example would be the claim that, well, uh, birth parents are much less likely to do har you know, fatal harm to their children than, 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 uh, than step-parents. Is that genes or is it simply the step-parents never wanted the kids? And so it, there's a self-selection yeah. as to who, who has them or not. And you obviously, you, you don't disagree with that. But the point is that when I read that, that to me kind of is a first order. I can't go beyond it. Second example, I'll take a stronger stand on. The Putnam paper actually is an example where the failure to deal with self-selection invalidates the paper. And the reason I say that is he's assuming that <laughs> whites who live in <laughs> diverse neighborhoods and don't, uh, there's no reason why. <laughs> <laughs> one happens to be in one yeah, versus yeah. the other. And so again, it's not, this wasn't about your papers, it's just an observation. This is, as an economist, the sort of thing that bothers me when I read these other papers. And so I just put that on the table, so let me stop there. Thank you. A previous graduate student of mine, called Adolo, he, uh, his dissertation is about genetic decompositions of mean phenotypes. And we substantiated that in simulation studies. And, uh, so I think I would claim that it is possible. What is possible? I couldn't. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh. We should a, move all these things. A previous graduate student of mine, Colin Dolan, he is now a professor at the uh, Free University <coughs> in uh, Amsterdam. His dissertation uh, was about the genetic decomposition of mean phenotypes. Okay, so I'll send you that stuff. Okay, well, I mean, I don't want to be quarrelsome. Simply, that model I wrote down. What is the issue is what a different. The, no, I'm sorry. The, I, I have, this no, was many, many years ago. No, the issue is what additional information he comes to bear. One can prove identification fails. Mm -hmm. Given, I made mean, very few assumptions. And the message, I did not mean to be destructive or nihilistic. No, it's rather no, no, to say no. you have to bring prior information. I focus, since I, where I work is on social stuff, I focus on prior information and social structure. Yeah. <coughs> Part of the reason that the genes are so interesting is you can bring prior biological information to bear. And that's, that's a different point. And all I meant was in this structure, because there's a dec the, the decomposition between the mean and the variance, <coughs> there's nothing that in that language could go, is relevant to the alphas. Well, it, it also was published in behavior genetics, so I, I will dig it up and send it to you. The details I forgot, I'm sorry. Please. Yeah, uh, just a, a brief comment that I, I think I, I pretty much, I think we're pretty much on the same, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the same uh, uh, 
view in terms of uh, what are the limitations uh, and what are the, the, the merits of, of um, what we can do econometrically because in fact I would, I would interpret a lot of my own questions about the mechanism uh, especially whether it's a direct effect or a barrier effect at the macro level as an issue about the fact that it's very difficult to disentangle where you directly get uh, intergenerationally and um, it could be genetic, it could be cultural interaction with what happens when different groups interact with each other, which is part of, all, you know, of the issue that the example that you gave is this sort of, uh, you know, you, you self-select into neighbors, you self, but, but at, the, at the macro level, you have trade with some groups rather than others, you are more likely to learn and imitate from some, while you discriminate against others. So, so those forces, if I, I, would, I would say we have, a, as economists, we have to study those exactly uh, having models, like uh, having, having priors so that we, we can test. And, uh, but in, any, in, in no means I, inter I interpret the, the finding of you know, sorry, an effect of genetic distance uh, as a causal effect of uh, specifically transmitted traits. Uh, on, on, if anything, it picks up the relation, the importance of the relations between populations. The fact <coughs> that some populations were much more closely related than others, they have shared common ancestors more recently or less recently. And that has to affect their interaction in more recent times, and that is, uh, and that is, I think, uh, the what we have to disentangle. Uh, and that's, that's why it's very much in the same spirit. And that's why I think economists and uh, behavioral genetics. Well, we should be friends with everybody except other economists. <laughs> uh, but the serious point is that we can bring substantive social science to bear in modeling, and so I'll conceivably say tomorrow I want to show how the same Becker Tomes model produces a version of the ACE model in, uh, in behavioral genetics. The interpretations are different. They don't have the same orthogonality conditions, but the point is that one one can proceed constructively. Mm -hmm. I I really enjoy that talk, and I share all these fears. But uh, you were talking mostly today about non-structural models, and while many of these things do apply, a, a sort of interesting frontier that people have worked on without that much success is to begin to think of the genetics as a structural model. I believe I have some prior reason to restrict the class of models mm -hmm. of what dopamine neurons can do to the way people become wealthy. And then I build my econometric model with the restrictions, with structural restrictions. And I mean, I know as economists, we haven't done that really. But I was wondering if you would reflect on it. I think it's an extraordinarily promising area. Uh, because, you know, the way that I think about these problems is there's some fairly minimal prior information. That's why you get a non-identification result. And notice everything I said was cross-sectional. I mean, there's additional information if you look at the intergenerational correlations that you refer to. And then you would sort of ask sequentially, how do we bring the information to bear? One of them is to actually take the, the implications of the unobserved heterogeneous genetics seriously. That, that would be the first step. And you're taking it, you, you're in, and indeed in the comments for Alba, we're making the same argument, as I understood it, which is, what I, as a kind of intrusion, call the mysterious unobserved heterogeneity, you can theorize about, and that capacity to theorize about it, the you know, it's a reduction of the parameter space or what have you. That is going to bias identification, obviously, it's that based on science, so that, that sounds pretty good to me. Please. Just a comment on this, go ahead. I, I don't think that's currently a promising avenue of research just because uh, the pleiotropic effects yeah. are so huge. Dopamine receptors express the litter. So, okay, so, so I mean, this is a fair point, and that's why I said this hasn't been done. I mean, well, you know that I know this. Yeah. Um, this has not been done successfully. For the first 10 years, everyone thought this was the way it was going to go down. And it turns out that the end, for even the simplest kind of trait, is closer to infinity than it is to one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, this has been a huge failure in biology, it's been a real catastrophe. Now, having said that, there are, as you know, people struggling and how to build new classes of structural models about gene networks. And I'm, I don't know what the right object of modeling is, and I don't know what I believe about the gene network models or the proteomics models that are beginning to emerge. But there are people who are, I mean, as an economist, there are people who are trying to build structural models and agree with all the My first generation I have stuff. to say, I admit that I have seen the first uh, paper by an economist that uses genes as IVs that I believe. And um, that was, um, Oh my God. Uh, Be very most careful of, given who's in the room. Because what he did, but he used a better strategy, which is he had this very specific hypothesis about 
the effect of arsenic in drinking water in India and, and the interaction with the gene and the effect on the IQ. Uh, but what the idea was not, we're never going to know that, that she, all the genes roles, but he had a counterfactual placebo population of Brown undergraduates and showed the gene was not at all related to IQ, absent the treatment of the arsenic in India in the Indian population. So assuming that Brown students don't have arsenic in their water. Um, so, so I think that's going to be the way to go. With, um, we're not, we're going to be agnostic about all the mechanisms, but, but we can have placebo tests uh, through different populations where we know the gene environment trigger is not there. Please. If I could just comment on the perception uh, concerning irreducible complexity in genomics, I, I think people uh, often have the wrong impression of it, and they should talk to animal and plant breeders uh, rather than talk to um, genomicists who primarily work on humans at this stage. Because it's true, we have very little grip on complex traits in humans. But if you actually look at uh, domesticated animal species, they're being bred now based on SNP data. They're not being bred based on pedigree. And they're very, very good predictive models. And so it's just a matter, in my opinion, of accumulating data before we can do similar things with humans that we currently already can do with plants and animals. So you, you can talk about networks of genes and nonlinear interactions, but in fact, Linear models in these other systems do tremendously good jobs, and there's a reason for that. I want to get back to your, to your, to your comment about the, the endogenous determination of, of ethnic groups. I mean, I think this is a very important point, not so much because these the, the, the heterogeneity in the US strikes me as particularly large, um, but because so, so, so much of the, 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 the the arguments about genes and social behavior draw from vastly disparate populations across the globe. And the, the degree to which sort of something as, as, as apparently fixed as, as uh, um, ethnic or ancestral belonging varies across groups is really, is really large, right? So in, in, in the US, if you have really dark skin, yeah, you're going to perceive yourself as black, and you're going to be perceived by others as black. That's a very different story in, in Brazil, for example, where the sort of the, the um, uh, the, the, the effect of, uh, of social class and, and class mobility on the self and other perception of race is vastly larger. So you mentioned Saperstein, Mara Lovman has done, uh, has done some really interesting work on, um, uh, on that.